Welcome to the Best Places to Lead Show. I am your host, Jerry McNamara, and I'm grateful that you are here or that you have decided to press play and to be with us. Listen, we are on a mission to positively impact 5 million people. It used to be over the next five years. We're one year into the mission, so now we have four to go do it. I like our trajectory and what it is that we're doing. As Bill Holmes, one of our super fans, always reminds me, we have to ask people to come join the mission. So, if you are interested in making the world a better place through better business, I would ask you to hit like, subscribe, share, invite, and let's go do this together because I have never met anyone who shows up to work and says, you know what? I really want to suck at work today. And yet there are plenty of people who are ineffective in their work. It's not their fault. It's our fault as the senior leaders. We have to do better in creating clarity, challenges, Make sure that people feel comfortable that they have the tools, time, and training to be successful and that our us as leaders, we actually care and give a shit about the people that we are leading. And I think that the recipe is pretty simple, yet it's a little bit hard to execute on or people find it hard to execute on. And so my whole hypothesis is that if you're good at home, you can be great at work. And if you're good at work, you have the potential to be great at home. So we've got to look at people as whole people and love them as whole people. I have found over the course of my career, everything just falls into place when you do that. And so I think if we can just put our egos down and to the side, learn from each other, which is why we're here with William Harris today. He's gonna share with us about his journey in growing an Inc fastest growing company and also a best places to work because we're always better together. I think if we can learn from each other, it's super fun. Bill Holmes, super fan here. Bill, thanks for being here and Russ Verhovic, one of my best CEO, COOs that I work with, super smart operational assassin. And so uh, super fun. So today, William, CEO of Element, performance-based marketing company based in Minnesota, a little bit different weather than here in yeah. Florida, because I'm in I'm in flip-flops. You look like you might have like a little sweater on today and that's okay, right? We, we choose different things. One of my life goals is to never shovel snow again after living in Toronto, Canada for a couple of years. Here's the background. So cut his teeth working in VC-backed SaaS startups before breaking out on his own, much like I started Proven Chaos almost by accident because people kept on saying, William, can you come help us? Can you give us some perspective? And it's much the same way that I ended up in this business almost by accident. And it's worked out really well. It's worked out really well for you too. Now, listen, I always think these are interesting when I do my, my lead up interviews. So I was doing research on you, William. I thought it was interesting that you went for nursing before you ended up with a business degree. We're going to talk about that in a second. But one of the other things that I loved was that we're both fellow nerds. We found out that both of us used to read the dictionary when we were young kids, while everyone else was reading comic books. So a fellow nerd, hat tip, hat tip to Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Right? And so, you know, because you were a fastest growing company and a best places to work, those are the types of CEOs that we're looking to learn from. So walk me through this. How does a guy who originally went to school for nursing end up as CEO of a performance-based marketing company? Yeah, I mean, that's one of those questions that everybody loves to ask because it's, it's the one that feels the most wild to people. The, the the short answer there is there's a lot of things that translate very well from nursing into, let's say, running an agency, especially within advertising. At, at a high level, there's a lot of math and science involved in nursing. And so the type of nursing that I did was open heart. Uh, and patients would come out from having you know, literally their heart taken out of their body and a new one put in and heart transplant. And they're on a lot of different medications that are dripping into their body at micrograms per minute. And you're looking at all of those. You also have to look at, you know, all of the different metrics that's going on within, well, what's the pressure within the left ventricle of their heart? It's just so many different metrics that you're looking at. And you have to make a decision within, you know, seconds here to make sure that you're titrating up or down on the right medications. And so you've got to be able to make those calls while being able to analyze things, just almost intuitively understanding the way that the metrics are all flowing together. And that's very true about advertising and marketing. And so that part translates very well. The other part that translates very well is, let's say, a compassion towards people and being able to connect on the human, emotional, psychological Ooh. level. So in advertising, as you can imagine, 
there's two parts to that. One is being able to connect with the customers that not your customers, but the customer customers of your customers and being able to understand psychologically what's going to motivate them to want to take action. And, and that's true for how do you get somebody to quit smoking that's smoked for the last 40 years, right? You have to think about this, not just, they're not going to appeal to just simply logic. That's not how the majority of human beings work. And so you just say, Hey, this is unhealthy for you. And here's all the reasons why. And they go, well, yeah, okay, but, right? And so it's like, okay, you got to think beyond that. And even just being able to gain their trust in a, in a very quick way where somebody comes in and, you know, this is their their family member that they, they see them with tubes coming out of their body and there's blood coming in these tubes. And you have to say that actually that blood is okay. We want to see that. If that blood stops, it's not a good thing right now. And, and just being able to kind of gain that trust to be able to help them through different things and help them feel better about where they're at and what's going on. That was an important part of this. And so I think that there's a lot that translates well. As far as my personal journey from this, I was working per diem as a nurse at the University of Minnesota. And so I got trained, if you can't tell, again, somebody who likes to read the dictionary, somebody who memorized pi out 59 digits just on my way to work the one time, I get bored easily. And so I got trained in every unit of the hospital, just about. I did not do maternity. I didn't do pediatrics, but I think I ended up in, in every other unit of, of the hospital there. And so I could just call in every night and say, hey, where do you need me tonight? And there was always a need, right? And so that means that I'm picking up time, like, you know, left and right. And I thought, okay, well, how do I solve this problem for them? The, and the problem was scheduling, right? And a lot of the scheduling, because it's very fast, it's on the, you know, you had 16 patients and then you just transferred some, you just got some that got life lighted in. And so, you know, they're doing it on paper and pencil. And I thought, well, got to be a way to do this in software to, to improve that. And I am finding a company called When I Work uh, that was a VC. Well, at the time they weren't VC backed, but they were a, a, a scheduling software company run by Chad Halverson. And I said, okay, so I talked to him and I wanted to use his API to build out the other 10% that I needed to do for the healthcare field. And we had a couple of good meetings and then he picked up some VC funding and uh, raised the Series A. At the time I was running another website called sixfigurenurse.com. And so he knew that I also had a degree in marketing and that I've been building up this other stuff. And he said, actually, why don't you come lead our marketing? Like you obviously understand the problem of scheduling and how this works. You understand marketing. I, I want you to just come do this. And so it was like, yeah, sure. Okay. That sounds like a good idea. And so that's how I got that initial transition into just leaving nursing into marketing. And then the rest came down from just writing about what we were doing on entrepreneur on fast company. And people, like you said, coming to me saying, Hey, I like what you're doing. Can you help me grow my business? And it was like, well, sure. Again, I, I like helping people. That's why I was in nursing in the first place. And I like I like working with numbers and solving problems and things like that. I know other people that I can bring in to do this, this, or that. And so, yeah, sure, let's do it. And that's kind of like where it started by accident. That might be the greatest explanation of a transition from one career to another, because that's not the explanation I was expecting from you, but I love it <laughs> because, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, firsthand, my mom was the recipient of a liver transplant, not a heart transplant, but a liver transplant. And I know what it means to walk into that room. My mom was in intensive care for 33 days wow. and she is in the hands of incredibly skilled, empathetic, kind people who are sharing with you what is right, what doesn't look right, what the concerns are. And so being able to build that trust because you know, when you can build no like and trust, anything is possible, which means you actually have to care. You have to be empathetic and, and be compassionate in doing that. And I think yeah. that spills over into every and anything in your life. I don't care whether it's personally, I don't care whether it's professionally, but as someone who has been on the other side of that, William, thank you for the work that you did, because I know what it means to walk into that room and not know what's going on. And so I hope that- yeah. The people that my mom was in care to, which they, she lived 16 years. We, we call it the golden ticket. She had Willy Wonka's awesome. golden ticket. It, it was amazing. And no one, no one did more with it. One of the things you said, though, I, I want to go down this, was you can provide all of the logic to someone. You know, you talked about smoking or, you know, behavior, getting people to take action. It's not the logic. So what, what's the tip that you have? How do we get people to move? To action. Yeah. So, you know, there's the, the idea oftentimes in psychology where they talk about the reptilian brain. Now that 
and presupposes, and I'll just say that it's like, uh, as a, as a believer, you know, I, I believe that we were created as human beings from the beginning. So the reptilian brain is not necessarily something that I would say, but I do think that let's just say there's a similarities in design, right? So either way, whichever direction you believe, which we've become human beings for where we are at this stage in life, that there's either similar design or that we evolved from, you know, earlier being. So if you think about it from the perspective of this reptilian brain, the reptilian brain makes a decision based on almost more, you know, gut instinct, if you would, where it's, it's just going to make a decision more emotionally based driven. Um, and then we rationalize it very quickly after the fact that we don't realize that we actually made the decision before we rationalized the decision that we made. And that's an interesting thing, but that's true. If you look at even a lot of things that you, you buy or do in life, oftentimes you made that decision more from an instinctual decision or something. You didn't set up a Venn diagram to decide whether that was the right thing to do or not. You you made a decision and then you rationalized that decision. And you may have thought that you have put a lot of thought into it, but very often you haven't. And so when you're thinking about that from an advertising perspective, a lot of this comes down to figuring out what is going to motivate somebody to want to buy this product or this service or whatever that is. And the thing that I make sure that I caution our team on, as well as I, I had the opportunity to speak at a, a university, oh, maybe maybe about a month ago here, uh, Northwestern University, to one of their mass, communica mass media communications classes, is you have to decide where you are from an ethical standpoint before you get into this line of work, because there's a lot of power in being able to understand a little bit more about human psychology and what's going to make somebody click and buy and and whatever, you have to decide where is that line and how far are you willing to push that. And we see people push we see people push that way too often, right? And they get in trouble with with that. And, and let's just say that you know, let's say over over sexualized advertising or something along those lines, where it's like, well, you know, where where do you draw the line personally? And that's the, that's something that each person has to answer for themselves. But I think I think you're you're on to it. I I had one you know, of my senior leaders here in in Florida, and one of the things that we were trying to look at was, are we in a recession or not? And I traced a ton of different data points through here, and at the end of the day, I said, I'm not sure if we're in a recession or not. And you only know after you've already been in a recession for two quarters that you're in a recession. I said, but what I do know is 91% of CEOs are preparing to be in a recession and are making cuts. And when we look at consumer confidence, even though it's taken an, an uptick in, in February, I don't know that it's been released in March, but you know, it was as low as what it looked like in 2008 when we were in the depths of things. And so People act out of emotion despite whatever the logic is. And so we have to be mindful of that because people are going to act out of emotion. So no matter what the logic says, be prepared for potentially things changing. And I think your your point is, is spot on because people act out of emotion and then rationalize after, well, look at Silicon Valley Bank. I knew that was going to happen. <clears throat> that's why I'm conserving cash. And that's why I'm moving my bank to Wells Fargo because you know, they're a more stable, larger bank. Those things I think are, are super important. That's One a fun of can of worms. Just that, yeah, well, yeah. I don't know how far deep you wanted to get into Go that, ahead. but yeah, well, you know, the the whole recession versus are we or aren't we and, and, and what that means. And, you know, the idea of even just the bank run in the first place, you know, is that's an emotional driven thing and, and what caused SVP. And sure, you can look at that and say, well, it's unsafe there. And it's like, well, sure, but money, all of it to a point unsafe everywhere in every bank. Like every bank could have a run on the bank and absolutely just destroy it if, if, if it all just decided to make that happen. And, and I think that's what happened to SVB too. Now, sure, there were some things that they did that pushed the envelope a little bit. We see this even within the crypto space. And I think that there's a lot of interesting things that have happened there as well. And so, yeah, I, I didn't know how far you want to go into that, but there's a there's a fun topic possibly for a later time. I, I, I think you're right. I think, you know, even as we think about leading companies, and whether you are responding out of logic and thought and planning and values alignment versus reacting. And I don't know about you, but I normally get in trouble when I start reacting things because, you know, there's an emotion behind it. And typically fear and anger do not lead to really good decisions and really good places. And so they lead to the dark um, side. I'm just kidding. I know, the, dark, the dark side. Talk to me about building a best places company. Was that something that you did intentionally as a strategy? Or was that something that just kind of happened organically? So that's a good question. As far as building a, a company that was going to win a best workplaces award, that was accidental. 
I hadn't thought about awards at the time. In fact, you and I were talking earlier when I started the agency, we had no awards, right? When you first start the agency, although it's like, why well, there's all this other good work that we've done. And so it's like, how do, you, how do you really stand out? And so the original version of our website said that we were we were an award-winning agency voted best agency of the year, three years in a row by my mom. And my mom was very good. I don't know why she didn't vote for us for the fourth year, but she she at least, you know, did for the first three years. And I think when it, you know, figuring out, okay, the idea of a best workplace award hadn't occurred to me because at the time when we built the agency, it was all me and contractors. And so we didn't actually bring on, we didn't bring on our first employee until 2020. And so, but I will say that when we did decide, okay, let's bring on these and, and start shifting a kind of the model that we've been using within the agency. One thing that was very important to me was the idea of taking care of the entire individual. And for a couple of reasons, one of which is, I believe that's just how my mom raised me. I believe that that is the moral and ethical obligation of somebody that's in in power or in charge of somebody else in some way to to do the absolute best they can to take care of them because my example for that was was Jesus washing the feet of his disciples and and you know from from my perspective then it's like like this is the son of god saying i'm going to wash your feet like that's a very you know, big deal to be able to say, like, I, I I serve you in this. And so that's my example. And so when we we are taking on our first employee, we said, okay, from employee one, we will have health insurance and not just help, you know, basic health insurance. We will have great health insurance and we will make sure that it is, we cover hundred percent. So we cover hundred percent of their health, dental, and vision from the get-go. Um, and then, you know, we, we knew that I wanted to do more than that. That's the basic of, of what we wanted to do. And so we started building more and more from there where we said, okay, what, again, going back to the psychology, what is it that people want? And I think that a lot of people as a general rule, they want some control over their destiny. Mm -hmm. and we can't, we can't always make that perfect in a, in a, in a perfect world, right? If you want complete autonomy over this, you, you're, you're probably just going to be a freelancer or your own boss. Mm -hmm. And so how do we get as close to that as possible within our environment? And so one, one of those is autonomy over your, your time. And so we do have unlimited PTO. And I know that sometimes that can get a bad rap. And I think that that's because people do implement it sometimes as a tactic or a gimmick. Whereas we actually go through and we, we, force people were saying you haven't taken time off you need to go take some time off this is this is not okay and i i'd say the average and i i don't know this for a fact but the average is probably going to be about three four weeks off a year that people take and so you know that's a, a pretty big deal for a company of our size we've got 13 employees and so that's a that's a big deal right to be able to take that much time off but then there's also just time off in the middle of the day to go you know hey i've got to go pick up my kid they're sick from school so we're just going to go and there's just there's, you know, no questions asked or anything like that, or even just, you know, hey, we've we've got got to go get an oil change or, or whatever this is, right? Where it's just like, it's very simple and easy to be able to say like, I'm just going to go do that. And, you know, I'll check this stuff here in a little bit. If you need me, ping me, we're good. And so time being a big part of it. And the other part of that is is financially. So being able to have some financial control over your destiny as well. Um, and so we have an un unlimited bonus potential for people. So there's a certain amount of bonus that's just tied to just company initiatives, which would be, did we hit our revenue goal? Do we have the, the money to pay out the bonus? And then do we, did you also work on other initiatives that might not necessarily move us forward from a strictly revenue perspective, but just make the business a better business, a better place for where we work. And so there's some certain things we tie towards each individual and departmentally and things like that. And so there's a, a portion of the budget tied to that. But the other part of this is a budget that is tied to their their actual contribution to the revenue of the company. And so based on whatever position you are and whatever seniority you are, the amount of revenue that you specifically generated. And so this is very easy in our business as an advertising agency to be right. able to mathematically pinpoint exactly what is driven by that. So that's a nice thing to do. But you get that then at the end of the year, which is really nice. And there's no limit to that. So you crush it, your clients grow 300% this year, you're going to make a really nice check at the end of the year. And that's a really nice thing to be able to give people that opportunity. You know, I think it's amazing that you do that. I, I, I was saying this a couple of weeks ago, my favorite question in 2022 came from one of my CEOs. And he called me and he said, I cannot believe I just got final numbers from our accounting firm. I cannot believe how well we did this year. Can you walk me through how I can share that with all of our employees? And I was awesome. like, this is an amazing conversation. And, you know, my wife was traveling. And so he and I spoke from about 730 when the kids went down to bed till about 930. And I gave him a number of frameworks to think about. But, you know, I, I think some of the things that I think about, because I love your, your idea of thinking about people as whole people. My first value is love your people and treat them as whole people. 
Because if you're not good at home, you can't be great at work. And if you're not good at work, you can't be great at home. You have to embrace the whole person. So I think there is a, a, a responsibility for us to wrap our arms around people and, and bring them in. And then I think sometimes where entrepreneurs and CEOs might get this wrong is we want people to act like they own it. But when the company does really well, we talk about the risks that we've taken and how we deserve all of that to come to us. Sure. And I just think there's a better way to, I don't know, if you want people to act like you own it, great, you can do that. But there's also a reward that goes back with it. And I think there's an inherent social compact to do that, to do that well, to do that right, what the responsibility is to create a compelling place where people show up and feel rewarded for the work that they're doing. Because, you know, my goal is to help senior leaders create compelling companies. Compelling companies always outperform in my experience. And the trick is always to make it home for dinner. Because if we have success without fulfillment, then it's the greatest ripoff in life. And so it's all of these things wrapped up. And, you know, I'm a big believer in remote hybrid work, the ability to have trust. You know, I look at my assistant, Maria, Maria's on the other side of the world. Maria's in the Philippines. We work together every day. I trust her to do her work. I don't have to micromanage. Why? Because she's earned the ability to do that. And I just look and say, Maria, what do you need from me? How can I help you? And you know, Meg Newhouse, who was probably around episode 20 or 24, she spoke brilliantly about remote work. And you know, these ideas that we have to see each other face to face to make sure people are working. Inherently, you're saying, I don't trust my people inside of my business and that they'll work better if they're in my, my actual visible care, as opposed to, well, if we knew exactly what people, what we needed from people to create an ROI, to keep the business working and moving in the right direction, then it would be really easy to let anyone work anywhere when they wanted to, when it's convenient to them, when they do their best work. Because I get up at four o'clock. And so some of my best work is before anyone even thinks about getting up. Hmm, and yet, sure. if I was in a traditional business, no one would give me credit for working from four o'clock to 6.30 when I start my day with my kids. And I just think it's a space where businesses can get it right more often. And I love that you're, you're doing it. You said a couple of interesting things there that I want to call out too, in that idea of not micromanaging. And I, I heard this just the other day, and I, I wish I remembered who I heard this from, but I don't. But it was something along the lines of not correcting your team, though, also isn't micromanaging. Correcting your team isn't micromanaging them. and that not, not correcting them is the wrong thing if it's wrong, right? And, and so there is this level of sometimes we're too afraid to to make corrections to, to people because we're afraid it's like, I don't want to micromanage. And it's like, well... But that's also just unloving if you know that somebody is not doing something in the most efficient way or something like that to, to not at least nip, not give them that that tool or that skill set to help them. And, and just the idea of a lot of times, I think the reason why entrepreneurs, especially we get in the, we, we can become micromanagers is, is, is two reasons. One, I think we can be conceited a little bit. Just being real, we, we, we had this idea and we're like, this is my idea. I'm really good at this and I figured it out. And so like nobody else can do it the way that I do it, right? And that's a very easy thing to, and you almost need that kind of stupidity and naivety a little bit in order to go into business for yourself in the first place. Like it's almost a, a benefit to your, to you to, to, to launch a company. But then there's the other side of this too, where it's like, we are often, oftentimes aren't the best at process anyways. And so we haven't clearly identified even like the overall trajectory or like the processes. And I think this is where EOS comes into play, where Mm -hmm. I felt a little bit, maybe more like a micromanager, which is not my natural personality. My personality is to be like, I actually don't want anything to do with it. Please just let me know if there's a problem. But then you feel like sometimes there's a need to step in. So you're like, well, that's not how I would have wanted it done here. Let me help with this. But implementing EOS was a really big help for us because you now, you actually organize your thoughts around what is our goal as a company. And for instance, our, our overall mission statement is to amplify joy through profitable business growth. That makes it really simple now for my team to almost ask themselves the question, hey, does this help that business grow profitably? Yes. Okay, do it. Does this help that business grow profitably? No. But does it amplify their joy? Yes. Okay, do it, right? And the idea here is that uh, let's say that you're wanting to send out like a, a package to a, a to a client because the, you just found out that their daughter graduated college and they're like, hey, this is awesome. Congratulations. You know, that doesn't necessarily help them grow profitably but it does amplify their joy. It gives them something that they're excited about and that you care and 
So there's things like that, that now our team can make those decisions themselves without having to ask me, hey, is this okay if I send this? Yeah, it's absolutely okay. Please do. That's a really good thing. And so by being able to more clearly articulate what those things are, documenting those processes, then I think it makes it easier to not micromanage. Yeah, I think I think two, I'm going to go back to two pieces. One is, I think when values are clear, decisions are easy, right? Matt, Matt Foxhall talked a lot about that in, I think, episode 10. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's that whole notion of like, if we all align to where it is that we're going, then it's really kind of simple. And, you know, one of the things that, that I talk about a lot is, how do you ease the burden of leadership? Because it can be, it can be lonely. And the notion is we've got to create clarity for all of the people around us. How do we make decisions? What's our economic model look like? What's our cultural model look like? There's all of those things because you want to give people the rules of the game. I ran a business that I knew I was going to be out of control in very quickly. We went from 7 million to 30 million in three and a half years. And so for me, I was like, huh, I cannot be involved in every decision. Let me give the rules of the game. The rules of the game that I gave were much like yours, wow our customers and treat our people as partners. Yeah. And so when we would have conversations about decisions, it was like, are we wowing our customer? Are we treating our people like partners? And sometimes we disagreed in the approach. And I would say, here's how I would be thinking about that. But it at least gave people, here are the gar- guardrails. Here are the guideposts yeah. to like stay inside the farm and we're cool. You go outside the farm, we're going to have a hard conversation. And, you know, that just allowed us to accelerate because I think, you know, when you look at leaders, what's our role? Our role is to create a predictable environment for agile, autonomous and engaged decisions. And the only way you can do that is if you are clear on the objectives that you're trying to, to go achieve. Exactly. And so that, that to me is, is everything. Walk me through this. How did you get to amplify joy through profitable business growth? Yeah. So, you know, that's part of the EOS process and there's a lot that we read and, uh, you know, a lot of things that they they give you to kind of go over and, and work through that. And then a lot of brainstorming. So we have our senior leadership team. And so, you know, everybody kind of putting up, you know, what are the things that we want to do? And at a, at a, at a basic level, if I was going to simply say, why do we exist as a, as a business? You have to look at this from, from two perspectives, Ron. One of these is like, why do people pay us money? <laughs> like, we, it doesn't matter what our goal is. If, if my goal is to do X, Y, Z from a, a social stance, none of that matters at all if nobody pays us money, if we don't have anything that people want to actually pay us to do. And so, you know, what is the core of what we're trying to do for businesses? Yes, we run advertising mostly for e-commerce stores right now, and, and, that's a, and we do it driving profit for them. So we optimize around EBITDA instead of just top-line revenue. But- when we think about this long term, you know, part of this is the idea of what does this mean in a hundred years, even as well. That's part of what EOS mm-hmm. talks about. I, e-commerce, I don't think is even going to be a thing a hundred years from now. It'll just be commerce, right? Like nobody's going to say e-commerce. It would just be weird. And so this would just be commerce, and it might be you know virtual. And there's all kinds of other versions of what commerce is going to mean. And so then it turns into well, and would we, let's say, a hundred years from now, would we still be just e-commerce or just commerce focused? And it's like, well. Probably not. The reality is would it would probably blend and we would probably have some acquisitions under our belt. And so we'd have different departments that are handling different types of businesses. And so we just said it's just profitable business growth. And that's that's open-ended enough that allows us to be able to say 100 years from now, this actual core focus doesn't change. Amplify joy through profitable business growth. And the amplify joy part is you can you can grow companies profitably and be a, an absolute tyrant. You you can do this in, in a really terrible way. And there's a lot of that out there as well. And so and we've seen these Enron being a great example, let's just say for, you know, hey, super profits are, are, are driving up these numbers, but but in a way that's completely unethical, that, that did not result in joy for people. And so it's just the idea of joy being better than happiness, right? I think happiness is much more considered as an emotion, whereas joy is something that you can feel even in the midst of grief or sorrow or hard times. You can be joyful even in the midst of like really difficult circumstances, like a recession, you can still find joy. And so joy being the key word. And then, you know, as far as the amplify part, you know, one of the things that I like is when you talk about the GDP, I think that there's some interesting correlations that I've seen studies that correlate GDP to a country's happiness or joy. And so one of the things here is that 
what we're doing is we're helping these businesses. Some of them are small, some of them are big, but as we continue to work on bigger and bigger businesses, this has a bigger impact. But you know, let's just say, you know, for the average one, it's like, well, you're amplifying the joy, you're you're creating joy for the actual direct person you work with by by just being a kind person and doing what you said you were going to do. That's that's actually one of the biggest joys that people can have is like you said you were gonna do it and you did it. Thank you. But then you take Novel that a little idea. Bit further. Yeah, right. And then you take that further though, and you let's say because you've increased their profitability, there's some joy that comes from that because there's some the grief and some burden that that just results in just like the uncertainty sometimes of, of financial situations. And so if we can, if we can increase that, that's good. Well, and then by doing that, because of that, that joy that trickles into the rest of their employees and those employees, then it trickles into their families and those families, then that trickles into their communities. And so it really does have this rippling effect. And there's a really good image called anger transference. And I'm drawing a blank on, on who the, the author of that, or the artist was Richard something, but it's called anger transference. And it shows that man getting reamed out by his boss. And then the, and it shows the man at home and he's yelling at his wife. And then it shows the wife yelling at her son and it shows the son yelling at the cat. And this idea that it's like, if you're driving down the road and somebody honks the horn at you, you're a little bit annoyed. Even if maybe you did stay at that light a little bit too long, you know, it turned red and you were checking your Instagram or something. I don't know. Right. And you're just like, oh man, like I was wrong, but still like, you know, who is this person that's honking their horn at me? It was like half a second, give me a break. And so you almost want to be mad at the next person that you see and you transfer that anger. But joy is the same way too. And, and, and if we've all had those moments where somebody's done something nice for you and you can't help but want to just kind of transfer that joy that somebody just showed to you, that grace, that kindness, and you're saying, I'm I want to be kind to the next person. And so if we do that to our team, if so if my focus is how do I make sure I do that to my team, then my team wants to transfer that joy and that kindness and that grace towards, you know, their clients. And then those clients, they transfer that to their families and their community. And it just amplifies from there. So that's kind of the, the thought behind it. I, I, I love it. Not only do we share a love of reading the dictionary, but we share a love of making a positive impact because that is my hypothesis in the second half of my career. That if we're great at work, we can go be great at home and, you know, embracing whole people. If you're not good at home, I, I need to know that too. If you lost a loved one, if you just got diagnosed with cancer, exactly. what are the compassionate things that we need to, to know and to do to make accommodations? Because these are people that are not just robots. These are people that right. I care about. And uh, that just makes all the difference in creating a compelling company, in my experience. Let's transition for half a second joy to a little bit of fear maybe maybe i'm maybe i'm wrong on this but you hired your first employee the week before covid kind of shut the world down yep what were you thinking at that moment of like holy smokes a weekend and suddenly the world has shut down walk me through that yeah you know it was interesting. I, I want to say Jeff's first official date was March 16th, if I remember correctly, 2020. All right. And as far as what was I thinking, well, we had already kind of gotten to an arrangement before that, right? So that was all still not really being discussed by the in the terms that we were actually talking about bringing Jeff on and as my as my partner, which you know, like the first official person that I'm officially paying outside of this. And a big part of this came down from just the idea of we were growing as an agency. And to your point of, you know, let's say being good at home, I was not good at home. I was working 100 hours a week. I was mm -hmm. getting to the point where if I don't make a change, I'm, I'm going to burn out if I, if I wasn't already there. And just that idea of I, I needed somebody that was in my corner too. You know, you talked about sometimes the loneliness almost of being, mm -hmm. you know, in leadership and, and how that can feel. And sometimes it was one of those things was like, I need somebody that that's on my side here that, that, that cares just as much about the success of this business as I do right now. And, and so that was a big part of this where it's, you know, to a point where it's like, it, it didn't really matter. Now, when we initially talked about Jeff coming on board, we had like these really interesting different roles and what I was going to be working on in the company and he was going to be working on in the company. And it's like, okay, well, that day happens. Like, and it's like, he's here. It's clear that we're shutting down. We've got one business that told us that they had to stop advertising at that time because they sold to, let's say like salons, basically they were, so they were an e-commerce mm -hmm. store, but they sold to, you know, salon owners. And so they're like, well, salons are shut down. So our customers aren't buying from us. We're just going to stop advertising for right now. And so we had another customer that reached out to us saying that they had to stop advertising because they weren't going to be able to get any shipments of new product in for a while. And so they're like, we don't, we're not going to have enough inventory. We're just going to sell with what we got and hope that we can stay afloat. And so it was one of those things you're like, well, that's going to change our initial plan. 
plans of what we need to do here. And so we decided, okay, let's actually go out and intentionally start growing and building the business, you know, in a different way. And which worked out really great in what we didn't know at the time at the beginning of the pandemic was this was also going to be a really great opportunity for e-commerce in general, right? So in March, we don't know that yet, but, you know, fast forward and, and we find out that, you know, e-commerce had a massive boom. So that worked out really well. And so then once we, we brought Jeff on, then the next person we brought on was Peter. And it was one of those ideas of it's like, we, we, I need somebody on our team who is thinking through all of the processes and stuff like that. It's like, let's start getting this stuff documented out. So that way we can start doing this. And uh, so we were, you know, building out our, our notion dashboards and everything like that at the time, and, and just trying to document what we had going on and, and just trying to make sure that we could kind of make sense of this. So that way we could scale intelligently and not scale, you know, un unprofitably. But yeah, at first it was, it was definitely a little bit fearful. And I think that every Boy, every CEO kind of has to go through that wrecking at one point in time where you say, like, this is a gamble. I, I, you know, I'm going to be taking this on. This is a big cost. And that's probably the hardest one to make. And I almost kind of relate it to kids, having kids where it's like that first time you have a kid, it's like your life changes, right? Like you're all of a sudden going to go from like, hey, we have all, you know, all these date nights together to, you know, I'm exhausted. We didn't sleep at all. And, you know, I don't want to change another diaper. I'm tired of this or whatever, right? It's like this. And there's a lot of beautiful things about it, but like it's a it's an initial wake up call of wow, this is this is crazy. But I think seeing just how you almost have to kind of go through those initial scary moments in order to kind of get over that. And I think that you get better and better at that the more that you take these steps. And each time you take that step of courage, you get better and more capable of taking that next step of courage, which actually reminds me a lot of the the movie that Matt Damon was in. We bought a zoo, and he talks about the the phrase was. All you need is 20 seconds of something like unrivaled courage. I forget the exact quote, but 20 seconds of courage. It's all it takes, right? 20 seconds. It's like count to 20, but it's like, you almost just need that 20 seconds to say, all right, that's it. I'm doing it. Like I'm signing. Here's the paperwork done. You're a partner. Let's go done. You're an employee. Let's go done. I I just quit my job and launched my business, whatever that is. It's, it's 20 seconds that you have to just kind of get over that fear of that moment. I love that. And it's worked out. Pretty good for you, right? Fast growing company, best places to work, you know, 13 employees. What was it that you about running a high growth company, right? I, I, I know what it meant for me. And, you know, like you, there was a lot of stress. You know, at one point at 26, I landed on a hospital gurney thinking I was having a heart attack. And I was like, whoa, wait a second. Life is real. These challenges are real. Stress is real. What was that like for you? What, what surprised you on the journey as you went? through that, give people some insight who might be on, you know, two steps behind you starting the journey of like, oh man, this thing's working. Yeah. Well, okay. So there's a lot of things there. I think the the thing that surprises or whatever that came along the way, one of the surprises I think for me is just the idea that, and I think you know this, but you almost have to be oblivious to it as well. You almost have to ignore it, which is the idea that there's another bigger harder problem right behind whatever the one that is that you just solved. And, and it was like to, you know, people that are, this is what they do and they, they feel more equipped to being able to help, you know, she's willing to help, but she's just like, I don't know what you want from me here. Right. And then the other thing with that was, you know, people who have been through those situations, they can help you see just how not big your problems are. And I think that's one of the things that I've heard from a lot of people in EO too, is it's just like recognizing that, oh yeah, you're having this problem. Guess what? All of these other people have also faced nearly an identical problem, whether it's a people problem, a profit problem, a process problem, right? It's like, they're all facing those same things, even if they're in their mm -hmm. completely different industries. And so just being able to hear their stories, have them laugh at you when you present a problem that they're like, yes, that's actually just not as remotely as big as you think of that problem is and stuff like that. I, I, I love that. I, I, I think about my own career and you know, I've run five businesses, five different industries, B2B, B2C, product services. And I always love when I'm talking to entrepreneurs and they say to me, no, 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 you don't understand my business. It's different. And I just kind of chuckle like, <laughs> okay, got it. Like I, yeah. I've now advised over a hundred businesses. Okay, got it. And then, you know, later on they laugh and go like, oh yeah, all right. Yeah, you had it. Right. And, and I do like somewhere on my blog, like in 2010 or 2011, I literally wrote about my biggest mistake as a senior leader was not having a business mentor, a business coach, or a business roundtable because you do have blind spots. You do have yeah. things that you don't quite know. You, you haven't quite been there. You haven't quite had the experience. 
And as long as you can put your ego down, which I'm a big believer, you know, I love Ryan Holiday's book, Ego is the Enemy, put yeah. your ego down. Let's make sure that we continue to ask the question, is this good for the business instead of is this good for me? And when you do that, everything just kind of falls into place and, and, it, and it's really good. Let, let me finish with this last question because I, I always like to think about leadership and you know, you've talked about EOS traction. A lot of people use that, that framework. I love it. I have a couple of companies that use it. It's great. Scaling up or Hornish is another good one. I don't care what platform you're using, but please right. plan your business, right? Don't leave yeah. success to chance. So I don't care what platform you use, use something. But one of the things that struck me when we were talking before the show was your role into the visionary, you know, which is one of the the two roles inside, you know, EOS, the visionary and the, and the integrator. And one of the things that you had said to me was thinking about how you as a company and individually can lead better. And so what are you thinking about? What have you learned since, you know, we talked a month ago, any insights that you're thinking about that you can share with people to say like, I've really been thinking about this because it's in my area of responsibility as the visionary, any insights that you can pull forward for people? Yeah, that's good. I think that one of the things that I have recognized more and more as a result of being able to give people that framework through EOS, being able to give people the, the like, here's our mission, here's our, our, our values, our, you know, here's our, here, here's our traction, here's where we're going to go, is that once that's done, I'm, I'm incredibly surprised at the really great ideas that have come from people on our team where I had absolutely nothing to do with it. And I think that's a really exciting thing because... Because I, again, it, it's natural as a problem solver entrepreneur who built something to sometimes, uh, like you said, you know, a little bit, sometimes the ego can get in the way and you have to check that from time to time. But then to see that it's like, well, because we were able to set that up, then these department heads were able to have their teamwork on this particular problem that deals with that. It, and, and then they just bring this to you and say, Hey, here's the idea that we have. Here's how we've, you know, what we've done to research it. Here's what we've done and our idea on how to solve it. And you're like, I, that's 10 times better than what I would have come up with. I genuinely would not have come up with that idea. And I think that that's one of the things I've been excited about. And I can see where that's, you can take that to that next level of growth by being able to get to that point. And so that's one of the biggest things that I've learned. The other thing that I'm I'm watching right now is just the, the you know, the economics of, of our time and, and just how that plays out for a lot of our businesses. And it's, I would say, it's it's hard in its own way, but it's also if you're uh, if you're in a position like this, it's fun. I enjoy it. And I think the thing that's interesting about that is it's like, well, who can enjoy watching an economic downturn? And it's like, well, I don't enjoy the repercussions of it. I don't enjoy people being hurt by it. I enjoy the math and the science of the of the strategy that's going into how do we make the right decisions behind this? And realizing that makes me say I'm in the right position within the company. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important thing is being able to recognize, are you in the right position within your own company? And there are times Times where you might have to say, I'm not, and and maybe I shouldn't be the CEO. I'm not a CEO. I'm really great at this or this or this, but this is not, these are not the problems that I like to solve. And so being able to see the excitement that I get out of some of these problems helps to confirm for me that I am the right person within the organization to want to tackle these problems. And, and that's encouraging. I, I, I love that you shared that because uh, Amanda Holmes, who's a, a friend and a client, her father wrote The Ultimate Sales Machine. She just rewrote it and was a bestseller in, in October. We, we talked a lot about this. There was a, a study of 4,000 companies over the last three recessions. Only 9% of companies grow their revenues during a recession. And one of the hallmarks that they learned was the most successful companies drove the initiatives and the objectives down further to the front lines, to the people who were closest to actually being able to see what was going on. And what I find when people are in fear or in anger, which are never the friends of good decisions, they try and start consolidating and, and like holding on to power instead of like driving the engaged, autonomous and agile decisions, which by de facto, you actually have to tell people, here are the things that we're trying to go achieve, which you know EOS forces you to do. Here are rocks, here are objectives. That's great, but it's a shiny object. Put it in the parking lot for consideration next quarter so that we can drive the results that we are moving forward to. I, I think that's that's so important. I, I have a, another CEO that I work with <clears throat> who I think is a, a fantastic leader, a fantastic business person. And he's gotten to a point to say, 
I may not be the right CEO for this company. And so he's now potentially willing to step aside because he's so committed to the success of his company to say, I may not be the right person to lead us where I want us to go. And I think that's incredibly humble and just amazingly self-aware for him to at least have that conversation because by all rights, he's doing a great job and has run a successful company for a long period of time. And so I, I think you're right. The awareness of, I am, am I in the right space thinking about the right things and still excited about the problem that we're solving? I think those are, those are super fun things. Great stuff. All right, William, how do people find more of you? Your insights have been terrific. I've really appreciated them. I appreciate the conversation, but people want to find out more about you or your insights or what you're thinking about. How do they find you? The, the three main places that I hang out would be on, just go to our website, which is element.com spelled E-L-U-M-Y-N-T.com or going to Twitter. So at Twitter, I'm at William Harris 101, but it's W-M-H-A-R-R-I-S 101 or on LinkedIn. So if you're you're on LinkedIn, right, there's a billion William Harris's out there. The, the specific one, if you're looking for me, linkedin.com slash in slash W-M-H-A-R-R-I-S. But those are the main places that I'm hanging out that I would be more than happy to chat, answer questions, anything along those lines. I love it. I thought I thought your insights were terrific. I mean, think, things that I think about, you know, when values are clear, decisions are easy, I'm putting, you know, Matt Foxall's words into yours. But what I find is there are hallmarks of great leaders that are out there. And you know, I've now been doing the show for over a year. There are certain themes that keep on coming up. Like we've got to distribute the information. If people don't know where we're going, then it's hard to make decisions. And leading is lonely. Therefore, let's bring on a partner. I'm willing to share that load because I'm not willing to share that or destroy my marriage or not see my kids or not make it home for dinner. And so I think when we get really conscious about the impact that we want to make, and, you know, I talk about the cost and the price, like if the cost you're paying is greater than the price you're getting back, right. then you're on, you're on the path to, to bankruptcy. And, you know, as Amanda and I have talked about before in, you know, her chapter 13, which is if you become financially wealthy and emotionally bankrupt, you have missed the point of life, yeah. right? Because you know, it, it, you, sh you have finances to create freedom for fulfillment. And the whole point of life is not to stack as many Benjamins in the bank account as you can. Although it's a nice thing to do, it can't be at all costs. And I think that's one of the lessons that you shared in starting to grow the company and realizing right away, holy smokes, this is going well, but I'm working a hundred hours and I actually like my wife and I want to give her a hug every right. once in a while. We're having kids and like, holy smokes, how, how am I going to do all of this? And so I, I love those, those ideas that you had. Thank you so much for sharing them with us, with our audience. Super fun. All right. Next week, we have Hamza Khan and Cameron Alaverdi. I think this is kind of fun because these guys run another Inc. fastest growing company called Get Earns. They deal with death every single day. Their business is um, for ashes of loved ones. And I think they have really interesting perspectives on running a business and being a compassionate business for people who are really in distress, making hard decisions and how they've done that is really fun and really interesting. They're fun guys. I've spoken with them twice and I think they're going to be a, a great guest next week. So I hope you join us. William, thanks for being here this week and Nels, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Jerry.